You all ready? All right, welcome everybody. We invited you here under the auspices of talking to you about Bitcoin and blockchains. And the truth is we're actually going to talk to you more about blockchains. And you're going to understand why, so with a little bit of a clickbait, uh, we will also talk about Bitcoin. But we're going to be talking primarily about blockchains. And the reason for that is that blockchains are actually going to be blowing up in pretty much every industry in the world in the future. And we give an example of that. We're going to do a blockchain challenge right now. So let's have somebody shout out the industry that they work in, and we will explain to you how blockchains are going to impact and affect and possibly disrupt that industry. So, this is a very ex experimental exercise. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go for it. Um, yes. Yeah. Retail. So I take this one. One example of retail is the um, the manufacturing, following the, the line of the manufacturing, where it starts, being able to track every step along the way, figuring out if that manufacturing was, uh, the clothes were made with slave labor or not, and, um, and then being able to actually authenticate all of this along the way, and then of course the financial component of manufacturing and sales as well. So the current supply chains are basically one big mess. It's like one supplier, supplier, everyone has their own systems, their own internal systems, and it's very, very hard to tie them together. With the with the blockchain, you have like a general ledger which helps keep track of uh, every single step of the uh, manufacturing and supply of the blockchain. Second yes. Healthcare. Healthcare. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, there's, there's different ones. So um, there is in let's say. The pharmaceutical industry, there is a lot of counterfeiting of um, drugs. of drugs, and so it's, it's same application as the um, as the retail one actually, um, just tracking down where the drugs have been, uh, have went, etc. That's probably a good one. Um, another health one, records. health records. That's that's probably the, the biggest one, yeah. Um, especially so in Europe, I'm not sure about the US, but in Europe we don't really have a centralized system that keeps our health records. So. The other day I changed doctors and then they physically had to send my medical records from since I was young to this other doctor via the mail, etc. Which is a huge pain in the ass. Now, if you use a centralized system for this, there is, there is a lot of um, privacy concerns. Um, who says that the company who hosts your records, like Google or some other centralized cloud, is not going to inspect and advertise um, this data, etc. Um, with the blockchain, you can basically um, deal with this in a decentralized way, which only you control. Yeah. Yes. Education. <laughs> uh, universities. Sure. We're looking at uh, certain uh, universities are looking at tracking uh, diplomas and certifications on the blockchain as well, preventing fraud, lying about it, and making the, the information easily accessible to anyone in when they're hiring, for example, to be able to look something up. Yeah. Um, so we can actually go way further as well. So, so now if we, we go to school basically to get a diploma and to, to be certified by this institution. If you go to an Ivy League college here in the US, you have like this big certification, right? Um, and there's no real um, um, general way of being certified by your uh, peers, peers, ex-employers, uh, whatever. So, um, however, these, these also count as some kind of reputation building or cert certification as well. And so if you, if you have this general ledger, which um, everyone can use to rate other people, pretty much like app, uh, which happens on Airbnb, etc., but then in a more general way, um, that, could, that could replace um, certain ways uh, of yeah, the, the, the traditional certification. So these are just a few examples. Thanks for throwing those out. We're going to cover a few more as we go along. My name is Katarina Rindy. I uh, was a teacher and worked in nonprofits and did project management and I've done community engagement and operations. I've been interested in technology uh, for many years and I started reading and um, watching videos and going to meetups about Bitcoin in late 2013. I got hooked by Bitcoin specifically because I saw the potential for people who uh, disenfranchise communities who don't have access to economic systems 
to be able to step in and start doing transactions, even if they were unbanked or underbanked, didn't have documents, lived in remote areas. They could send small amounts of money, and all they needed was a cell phone. I got super excited about this and dove in uh, about that. And right now, I'm a consultant. I, I advise people on uh, Bitcoin blockchain projects. I'm an educator, and I'm a speaker. So I'm, I'm Jeff Cavins. I'm Belgian. Um, I, I ran a digital agency um, back in Belgium for like seven or eight years. And then at some point, um, a friend of mine told me about Bitcoin. And literally since the next day, that's been my main focus. So three months later, I sold my agency. I booked the tickets to San Francisco. I spent like a year in San Francisco diving into all the projects, meeting all the people. And it's been my main focus ever since. Um, I'm currently a partner in a consultancy company in The Hague. And we, uh, one of our main focuses is blockchain technology, specifically the loan financial application. So in the last year, we built several um, uh, blockchain-based applications for traditional companies, going from FMCG to um, to energy companies, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So this is more or less our agenda. This is what we're going to cover today. Um, we will touch on Bitcoin. We will talk about Ethereum, which is next-level blockchain. Is there someone who knows Ethereum? Yeah. Raise your hand if you've heard of Ethereum before. Okay. Sure. Fantastic. Okay. Good. Uh, it's okay if you haven't, because this is sort of this is Bitcoin blockchain for beginners, ostensibly. But we're we're gonna we're gonna give you a lot of information, and uh, you're gonna walk out here sounding pretty smart, almost as smart. Not as Belgian. So um, yeah. So we did this little experiment just to get your feet wet and like see how broad. Um, the range of applications is for this for this technology, and so defining blockchain is is is, is pretty hard. It's not a linear concept. It's pretty much like defining the internet. It's also super hard. You can define you can probably define the underlying technology, but then it doesn't really give you a sense of the um, the scope of applications and the impact it has on the world. Um, so it's, it's it's pretty hard. And so if you if you ask people what is blockchain, then you usually get blockchain is a decentralized ledger. Now it is a decentralized ledger, but we think it's um, it's not only that. It's, it actually goes way further, and it's also kind of a boring definition, isn't it? So um, we tend to um, use another definition, which is a blockchain is a global unforgeable computer. Now this definition has three components to it. So it's, it's global, meaning it's hooked up to the internet. So it's potentially accessible around the world by anyone. Um, it's unforgeable, meaning it's cryptographically secured, and it's a computer. The computer has two components, so it can process code, and it can store data. So it's still a ledger in the sense that it is, it is holding information, it's holding transaction information and additional information, but it can do more than just hold information. It can be more than just a ledger, and it can actually process code like a computer does. So who thinks this definition is more exciting than the decentralized uh, ledger? Okay. <clears throat> so, so, um, so blockchains basically enable true peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so the current peer-to-peer -peer systems like, um, I supposedly peer-to-peer -peer systems like Airbnb, for instance, have the image of being peer-to-peer, -peer, but actually not peer-to-peer -peer at all. There's still this huge Airbnb corporation or Uber Inc. sitting in the middle and taking all these which is not necessarily bad, but, um, yeah. Examples. So these are a few other uh, industries that are being affected or could be affected and disrupted, probably will be by blockchain. When we think about energy, we can think about legacy energy systems. So the way they exist right now, you have an energy power plant, you have distribution lines, you have consumers, and then you have a, a, an entity corporation or a, uh, a federal company that um, delivers and charges you and does the settlement and measures how much energy you're using. And with blockchain systems and with the advent of more people providing their own energy using solar panels, for example, then we can think about the ways blockchain can disrupt this industry. Yeah, we actually, um, in, in my company, we actually build a uh, actual proof of concept of this, so we just took a little Raspberry Pi computer, we put a blockchain node on top of it, we connected it to the, um, to the smart meter in your home, which me measures all the energy you're consuming, producing, and uh, or storing, and then instead of going through some centralized third party to deal with a settlement, if you want to trade energy amongst your neighbors, um, this little um, uh, blockchain system just takes care of it by itself, in a very magical way. Awesome. Um, it's pretty good. Yeah. 
Next example, Internet of Things. Right now, the way that people are seeing the Internet of Things being used, accessed, is uh, remote video cameras. You can see what's happening in other people's houses. You can watch puppies. You can uh, um, control, remote control the heating and air conditioning in your house for the nest. Um, or there are remote locks that currently exist where you can lock and unlock your house when you're there, when you're not there, uh, if you have a guest coming, for example. And this is a fantastic opportunity for blockchain management as well. Yeah, so, so if you want to, so um, one part is you have all these devices, these Internet of Things devices, but they still need to run on some kind of uh, logic and trans transactional layer. Now, in the, in the current world, so currently these devices are managed by centralized uh, layers on top of Microsoft platforms or, or Google platforms, etc., which is potentially dangerous for privacy, etc. Um, now, with uh, blockchain technology, you can um, have a smart lock, for instance, which can be managed wholly off of the blockchain. So you can, so um, the owner of the lock or the owner of the house, let's say um, an Airbnb uh, person, so he wants to rent his, his, his house, he has one of these locks, and then he says, okay, I'm on holiday in the coming whatever two weeks, and then someone can, 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 can go and just send a transaction to this lock. It's actually sending money to this actual lock, and then the lock checks up. Can, can I, um, does my owner allow me, allow me to take transactions from someone else? If yes, then this person who sent the transaction can control the lock for the next five days or so. This is, tr this is truly peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no entity sitting in between, which makes everything much more efficient and um, potentially more honest. Or, uh, so, financial systems are uh, most obviously being disrupted right now. In fact, there's quite a bit of investment from traditional financial institutions into this, into uh, blockchain technology. And Bitcoin is, as a peer-to-peer -peer currency, as a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cash alternative, is, the, uh, is the, the obvious first use of Bitcoin blockchain. So, we're going to talk about, do you want to talk a little bit more about other financial systems, or should we just go into Bitcoin? Well, um, so if, if you hear about uh, Bitcoin and people think, oh, the banks are going to die, whatever, but Bitcoin is just a very specific application. It, it taps into the currency aspect of, of the whole banking industry. Whereas the banking industry, the financial industry is much broader, right? So you have insurance, for instance, which is very important. You have credits, and pretty much 99% of what banks do is credits or based on credit. Um, and then you have the, the currency components. Um, now, with these newer blockchain systems, you can basically disrupt the whole financial industry, but it takes a little bit more than just um, coming to a new kind of currency, which Bitcoin is. Um, and then, yeah, so now we're going to dive a little bit So we'll, we'll move into Bitcoin then next, but we'll come back around and talk a little bit more about financial systems. So a little bit of history uh, about Bitcoin. Bitcoin was created, Bitcoin and blockchain technology was created by Satoshi Nakamoto, who is a pseudonym. No one knows exactly who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Could be a woman, could be a group of people. Someone in the audience. Could be someone here in the audience. Can you come back and tell me what it is? And Satoshi wrote a white paper in late 20, 2008. And the, the climate at the time was in the middle of the 2008 economic crisis when financial institutions were, it was obvious that they had caused many of these crises and people could not access their money uh, or were losing their money along the way. In uh, early 2009, uh, the code was actually released, Satoshi released it, and uh, it is open source, visible by anyone, and downloadable by anyone, which it still exists. Anyone who wants to download the Bitcoin blockchain uh, software can do that and can use it on their, on their computer. In 2010, the first uh, public Bitcoin transaction for product uh, was made, and it was 10,000 Bitcoin were sent to a fellow in Florida who used it to buy two Papa John's pizzas. And uh, that's May, in May, so everyone celebrates that day. It's called Bitcoin Pizza Day. So what is the current value of 10,000 Bitcoin? Right now, the current value of Bitcoin is about $410 for one Bitcoin. So it's gone up in value now. In 2011, WikiLeaks started accepting Bitcoin for donations, which is kind of a big deal because WikiLeaks, all the other financial processes that, that they were using refused to accept donations anymore, but nobody could stop them from using Bitcoin. Governments can't control it, banks can't control it, corporations can't control it. 
In 2011, the Mountain Gox, which was one of the first exchanges, was created. Who has heard of Mountain Gox? Anyone heard of Mountain Gox? <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of attention uh, towards the end in 2013, 2014, when it failed, but there are quite a few other exchanges that have come up and now and exist currently. Um, and then Silk Road got quite a bit of attention in 2011 through 2013 for uh, using Bitcoin to buy illegal products. Um, but Bitcoin is still in existence, and since then, uh, 2014, Newsweek did an expose on Satoshi Nakamoto. They were wrong, they didn't have the right person, but that was one of the first mainstream magazines to start talking about Bitcoin and the sort of mystery behind it. 2015, the US NASDAQ started experimenting with their own private blockchain. Currently, Bitcoin is worth around $410 for one Bitcoin. The price is still going up and down as people figure out how to adopt it, whether they want to adopt it, as it's treated differently in different countries. Uh, the market cap of Bitcoin is currently $6.34 billion. You can buy pretty much anything with Bitcoin now, anywhere all over the world. Um, Austin has three Bitcoin ATMs, by the way, if you wanted to go buy some Bitcoin. And um, a bit, we're going to talk a little bit now about Bitcoin under the hood, but one of the components is that the way that Satoshi programmed it, uh, it was maxed out at 21 million Bitcoin, and that was intentionally done to create scarcity so that uh, it would not be affected by inflation as other currencies often are. So it pretty much emulates some of the properties of gold. Uh, some people call it digital gold. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Bitcoin is and why it's important and how it works. Um, in a, a traditional banking relationship, we think of this as a peer-to-peer -peer currency, which is the way that uh, Satoshi intended it. You go to a bank, you show your ID, you uh, either open a bank account or you have a bank account and you say, I want to send $100. I have that you know I want to send $100 to Jeff Collins. And the bank teller says, okay checks my uh, bank account, um, writes down this transaction, and then the money goes to Jeff, and then Jeff says, yes, I got the $100, and so there's three of us involved in that transaction, and the steps are, I have to identify myself, I have to have the proper documentation to say who I am and that I have access to this account. The bank tracks the transaction, where it goes, where it came from, they charge me any fees that they want to, and then Jeff confirms yes, and there's consensus amongst the three of us that this transaction happened. So that's what it looks like right now. With Bitcoin, the identification portion, so, so that, to back up, that is a centralized system. That is basically the bank controlling all of that process. With Bitcoin, in a true peer-to-peer -peer version of it, we use public key cryptography to identify ourselves and to confirm that we have access to that account. We use a distributed ledger, meaning it's not just one bank that has access to that information, but everybody all over the world that's on the Bitcoin blockchain network can see that I am sending this money to this other person. And everyone all over the world, when they see that, they say, yes, that transaction is valid, all the steps were taken properly, we agree, and we've all seen this and confirmed that it happened at this date at this time. That is what we call the magic internet money of the future, and how it's an improvement in, in some ways on that. Yeah. So to go from a, a, a totally centralized um, system to a totally decentralized system. You basically have to decentralize each of, the, of these components. And so as Katarina said, you have public key cryptography, a distributed ledger, and a distri distributed form of consensus. Now, to dive a little bit deeper into that, the, the public key cryptography uh, taps into um, the, the fact that you need some kind of account or number so that people can transfer you money, right? And so in, your, in the current system, you have your bank account number. In a, in a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency system, you have this public address, which is the green one. Um, you can share this address with, with anyone. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that they send you money. Um, the, the, the blue one is a private key, and so you need the private key in order to send transactions. So whoever, whoever owns the private key or has the private key uh, can access um, their money. Now, one additional component of it being a public address is that someone can search and see how much money you actually have in that account. 
So this is also public information. Yeah, now, um, obviously there, there are systems being built that make abstraction of all this, but this is actually what it, how it works under, under the hood. Um, now, as Katrina said, instead of having one bank or several banks having a copy of, of a ledger, you have every single participant in the system has a copy of, of, of the ledger. So everyone can inspect um, all the transactions. Does that mean you have to give up uh, privacy? In some way you do, but it's, it's actually a pseudonymous system. So you see a certain public key doing a transaction with another public key. You don't, you don't see Katrina um, sending money to Jeff. So the names are not necessarily associated with the public keys. They can be, but they aren't necessarily. Now the NSA can probably find out who everyone is if they want to, but there are uh, ways to be, that's why we call it pseudonymous basically. There's ways to be more public and there's ways to be a little, a little less public. Yeah, some companies want to, want to try to make it more public and some companies want to, make it, want to try to make it more private. So we have this nice interaction. Um, so apart from a distributed ledger, you need some way of timestamping the transactions. You have all these transactions, people are sending transactions all the time, and you need to have a way to see which transaction came first. And so the way they solve in Bitcoin, instead of having a bank that says, okay, this is the current state of the ledger, and then they wait a day or half a day, now this is the current state of the ledger, you have a, a block system. So um, uh, participants in the network, they basically grab a bunch of transactions, and then the network tries to solve a very complex mathematical uh, puzzle, which takes on average 10 minutes to solve. And then when the puzzle is solved, a new block is created, which is basically just timestamping a bunch of transactions. And then the network goes on and um, tries to solve the next puzzle, which will create the next block. This and is a simplified explanation. Be yeah. If you need a more technical explanation, come talk to us afterwards. And so this whole process we call mining. Who's heard about mining? Okay, so this is mining. So every miner, everyone who puts their server capacity or computer capacity into a network uh, needs to get some, <clears throat> some kind of financial incentive to, to uh, mine because they're using their hardware and energy, etc. And so that is, that is the, that's called the block reward, which is currently um, at 25 Bitcoin per block that's being mined. So every, every 10 minutes, 25 new Bitcoins go into the systems, into the system and the, the miners uh, use this as a reward. And to, to explain that in a slightly different way, this, the, the way the blockchain program works, once this difficult problem is and it is rewarded to the miners, so that is their incentive for doing this problem, for bundling the transactions together, for creating another block of information on the blockchain, on this, this ledger that is linked all together chronologically. And uh, everyone refers to it as mining, but I like to call it unlocking or, or sort of releasing the funds that are going to reach a maximum of 21 million, because um, it's not exactly someone like mining for gold. So just to clarify that a little bit, it's confusing. This is actually a puzzle that gets solved. It's a, a, some kind of hashing uh, magic that happens. Um, we're not going to dive into this, but we're going to do a little exercise at the end of the session, um, which basically mimics the, the miners' uh, process. So, from this Bitcoin under the hood, we're going to start talking about Ethereum. And again, Ethereum is another kind of blockchain. It is sort of the next improved version of Bitcoin blockchain that's grown out of it. More people are building upon because it has additional properties that are an improvement over the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, and so um, there's, a whole, I, there's a whole team behind Ethereum now, but it all started with a, um, a genius Canadian-Russian uh, guy who's now 22 years old called Vitaly Guterin. And I need to add that that is actually his real name. He's, he's, not, he's not a pseudo, uh, anonymous person like Satoshi Nakamoto. This is actually his name. So um, and Vitaly he used to be um, pretty well respected in the Bitcoin space. One of the first guys who saw the alternatives alternative use, uses for, for his blockchain technology. And so he was involved in a, in a project called MasterCoin, which tried to do all kinds of non-financial or non-currency stuff on top of the blockchain. Now, he was involved in a couple of other guys as well. And then um, he and, and some other guys, they saw, OK, this is not, not really going where he wanted to go. And so he basically wrote down his own ideas in uh, December 2013 in, in a white paper, the first Ethereum white paper. Um, from there on, <coughs> They did a crowd sale to fund the, the development effort, and they raised 18 million in Bitcoin in uh, August 2014. Um, and ever since, they've been yeah, hiding in, in caves all across the globe.
and tried to build or release the first version, which happened in July 2015, which was a very unstable uh, shitty release, actually. But tomorrow, on Pi Day, um, they, they're going to release their first stable version. Now, um, so I was in a, in, a, in a blockchain hackathon last October in New York, and there were 15 teams, so we got 24 hour, hours to come up with a new like, blockchain application. And we, it was basically um, technology agnostic, so you could choose whatever blockchain technology you wanted, but after 24 hours, 13 out of 15 teams just built on top of Ethereum. Um, and so that's where you see where the magic is if developers really start using it. Um, this is also interesting, uh, how this space can evolve. A pretty similar thing happened with Bitcoin, but um, at the crowd sale in August 2014, one Ether, so Ether is the currency which is used within Ethereum, like the Bitcoin token is used within the Bitcoin system. Um, an Ether, one Ether token was worth 30 cents in the crowd sale, and it's recently like, skyrocketed and is today $14. Which is times... 49. So, if you can imagine the blockchain plus steroids, it's not the magic we need that money of the future, it's the magic internet of the future, except the steroids are actually a programming language. So this is one of the properties that differentiate it from the Bitcoin blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain is very good at financial transactions, pretty good at financial transactions. But if people started trying to do additional things and put additional data and information on top of it, it hits some some scaling issues. Yeah, it's pretty comparable to um, <coughs> it's pretty comparable to you can convert email to uh, Bitcoin, for instance. Email is a very specific uh, application of the internet, but the internet can do more than just email, right? And so Ethereum is basically takes a step back, and it just allows everyone with their embedded programming language to build whatever application on top of this uh, on top of their, uh, their blockchain. So you can build a new currency, you can build a new Bitcoin competitor in top of Ethereum, but you can also build an energy system or an insurance system or whatever blockchain-based system. Um, so for the more technical people, it's more, more like in the TCP IP of the internet. Basically. And so the way this, so the, the way this um, is, is different compared to Bitcoin, um, on a technical level, you also have these distributed ledgers, so everyone has a copy of the ledger. Now, in Bitcoin, this ledger only has the, um, the, the, the amount of uh, Bitcoin everyone um, has in their wallets. In Ethereum, we have um, a ledger which can actually store uh, software programs. Um, millions, potentially millions of software programs. And so everyone can interact with these software programs. So if you come back to our lottery example from before, this could be, this is like a very simple, um, uh, example of, 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 of this lottery system. So you have a public address, which is, a, which is an, uh, an Ether address. People can send money to this address. And then if the day is Saturday at 9 to 6 p.m., then just run a random function for all the, uh, all, the, all, the, all the people that send money to this address and then pay out a winner. It's, it's literally as simple as that. Um, actually, it's more complex. Um, but uh, this exists on, on top of Ethereum right now. You can just uh, put it out there, no one can take it down, uh, everyone can interact with it globally, it's 100, potentially 100% 100 efficient. If you're the creator of one of these programs and you add a little fee for yourself, that's totally fine. You can say, okay, I want to have a creator, I put all this hard energy in writing this, this uh, well, a few lines of code, and I want 5% of everything, of all the revenue, that's totally fine, but people will be able to inspect it and see it, right? So everyone can see on the blockchain, ah, there is like a 5% inefficiency in this program. Um, and then someone, someone else can just go in and copy the code and like uh, throw out the, um, the So we're going to touch just a little bit on private and public blockchains because this is kind of a hot topic in the news right now. So uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are 100% public blockchains in that they are fully transparent, anyone can use them, anyone can inspect them. There are clearly financial institutions that are exploring and uh, researching and experimenting with creating their own private blockchains. So they're taking some of the properties and elements of public blockchains, but they don't want to have the full transparency. They don't want everyone to be able to see the information, and they don't want everyone to be able to contribute to the process as well. So they're creating these closed, permissioned private blockchains where they will say, okay, maybe only 
10 people can access this information, or you have to uh, have abided by these particular rules and regulations, and then you can join in this, in this private blockchain. There are, however, there's, there's varying degrees of each of these different kinds of properties. So this is all being sort of experimented with right now, and it's pretty interesting. Um, there's also ways in which they're doing both private blockchains, but then putting a timestamp that references the transaction on the public blockchain, so that they're, they're actually interacting. And there's also efforts right now to take some of these private blockchains and standardize them so that they are all using some basic standard frameworks so that they will still be able to communicate and interact uh, rather than have these siloed systems. So this, this is in the news quite a bit right now, especially with some big financial institutions, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, the NASDAQ. Um, maybe, maybe we can give an example. So a good example for this could be uh, potentially Visa, for instance. So Visa is basically a way of linking all the, 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 the banks on a global level. And so whenever someone in the US uh, makes a credit card payment in Europe using their American uh, Visa, then, um, then the, the Visa system basically settles everything. So it does the work uh, for the banks. So the banks don't, don't have to know each other. They, they just all know Visa, and Visa does the actual settlement. And so a use case for a private blockchain could be uh, replacing Visa. So the Visa, Visa system is now replaced by a blockchain system, and all the banks just um, uh, are members of this blockchain system. So not everyone can join. So they can say, OK, um, it's limited to all the major banks in the world, uh, for example, um, and then set their own rules and agreements, etc. So that is that's a, um, a potential use case, which is being looked at currently. Regulations around Bitcoin use right now really vary by country. In the US, Bitcoin is called a commodity or property and is taxed accordingly. In China, you can use it as a private citizen, but financial institutions are not allowed to use Bitcoin. In Germany, it's considered private money. In the UK, it's unregulated. In fact, UK is quite friendly and uh, has been encouraging quite a bit of blockchain and, and Bitcoin research and startups. In Australia, it's currently unregulated. It, they're starting to, to look at it more carefully and consider regulating it. And in Russia, it's just illegal. And you go to jail, theoretically, if you can spend it Which is kind of ironic because you know there's people in Russia using it. From there, we are going to move into a hands-on, this is sort of the workshop part of this. So raise your hand if you are interested in opening or having a Bitcoin wallet, creating a Bitcoin wallet today. Woot! I say cryptocurrency wallet because some of these also will allow you to uh, exchange or use other cryptocurrencies. We haven't really talked about them other than Ether, but there are actually other cryptocurrencies. There's Litecoin, there's Dogecoin, which has a big dog head on it. Um, so, so we're going to do that. So um, if you have a, a, a device right now, we're going to talk about, um, give you examples on um, uh, wallets that you can set up online, on apps, um, on websites. We're going to show you a hardware wallet. And, um, and then we're just going to give you a few more other resources. And um, if you tweet uh, my name or at me and talk about this session in some capacity, it's Katarina Rindy, and we'll give the link somewhere, I guess it's at the end. Um, once you've set up your wallet, I will send you Bitcoin. If you mention Jeff Commons, Commons or Ethereum, he will send you some Ether, um, but we need to have your actual wallet here on Facebook, on Reddit, on WordPress, on all of these. Um, we can just say, hey, I'm sending you, you know, $5 or a beer's worth or whatever, and then you get that, that amount. So, we're gonna do that now, and you're in charge of this. I have lots of your phone. So let's see, the first one we'll show you is, this is blockchain.info. And what's cool about this site is that the scrolling that you see down there at the bottom, those are Bitcoin transactions that are happening live. This is also a blockchain explorer, which means if you have my Bitcoin address or a transaction uh, uh, URL or address that someone has given to you, you could put it up there in the small white box and see what happened with that transaction, how much money was sent, when it was sent, how much money is in that account, et cetera. So that's called a blockchain explorer. Blockchain Info offers this. Blockchain Info also has a wallet. We can show you. So the advantage of blockchain.info is that it is not linked to your bank account. 
You do not need to tell it your name. This offers more anonymity than other Bitcoin wallets, if you are interested in that. Uh, they also do some additional measures. They have good security. Uh, so that's one option. Uh, they also have a phone app. And then let's show them the next So one. people can go ahead and set up. Uh, if you want, we should tell you. As you're all setting up your wallets right now, uh, as I said earlier, we're going to show my uh, Twitter address. Um, tweet at me, and once the session is over, if I have your actual new wallet address, I will send you some Bitcoin. If you want Ether from Jeff, then mention Ethereum and your wallet address, and he will send you some Ether. And if you want something else, just, just tweet at us and mention the account. I see a hand way up in the back. How are we supposed to? Wallet yeah, yeah, so you will get an actual wallet address. It's going to be a long string of numbers, and you just copy that and paste it on. And it means that your address will be public, so your name will be attached to it. If you're uncomfortable with that, then we'll do change tip or something else. So I totally respect anonymity if you prefer. Yeah. But but I want to make sure to encourage all of you to actually set something up while you're here. Coinbase or blockchain.info are just the, the examples, or Kraken as an exchange. And I can let me know if you need me to read any of that out loud. So, so make, make sure you don't tweet your private key. Not your private key, right. It will say this is your public key. Yeah. Um, I can't see your Twitter handle. You can't see Twitter handle? Okay. So my name, it's just basically my first name and my last name together. And I'll spell it. It's C-A-T-E-R-I-N-A-R-I-N-D-I. -I -I. This guy. That's it. So tweet at me. Now I won't be able to send it to you right now, but I will send it to you today, I promise. Don't plan to get too drunk with it. And I see things coming in right now. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, so there, there was actually this uh, this TV presenter uh, a couple of years ago, and he, he didn't really understand Bitcoin, and he, he, he just showed his his, uh, his, his, his little QR code, but it had a, like a public address and a private address. He showed it on TV, and someone just scanned the public uh, the private key and he ran off it all with Bitcoin. So, yeah. Yeah, so make sure it's your public key. The other thing we can do is if you want me to send you Bitcoin but you don't want your name attached to it, then DM me or tell me, hey, I want to give it to you but I don't want my public key being super public. So, okay. Yes, okay, so the last little bit then is change tip. As I said, if you don't want to set up a wallet today but you do want me to encourage you in some way to get involved with this, then uh, tweet at me and just say, I'm interested in using change tip and I will send you some. Uh, probably a thumbs up via the change tip, which I think is like $1.50 or something. I don't know, I set it up. The change tip is really cool because you can use it with all, on all these different social media platforms and it's uh, a way to support artists and writers and also just sort of, you know, rather than just hitting a thumbs up on Facebook, you're actually gonna send a little bit of uh, a little tip. So it's a very social uh, way of interacting with it. One more little exercise, and then we'll take questions, questions, questions. But maybe it's a practical question. It looks practical. We'll do it later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So um, on the slides here, these are URLs of all the sites that we just showed you, plus some additional ones. This whole uh, presentation, this whole slide uh, presentation, is going to be available to you all to download. In fact, it's already up there. So you can take a picture now, or um, you can get it from the site. It's on, it's on slide share by my name. Um, but we'll show you that. And we're going to do a little exercise. So this, can you go back? Sure. this um, hardware wallet, it's called a Ledger Nano. And I got a spare one to give away, a brand new one, unused, that of course I forgot to bring with me, but I promised to mail it to you. And we're going to do a little game right now. And whoever wins the game is going to win a hardware Bitcoin wallet. And this game is called the mining game. And it's basically, we told you that there's a very difficult uh, math equation that, that miners have to, have to solve to unlock the Bitcoin, to earn the Bitcoin reward. So we're going to have you do this equation, this, this difficult uh, problem right now. And whoever solves it first will win the, the wallet. And that's basically how it works with Bitcoin. Whoever solves the equation first, it's a little bit of you know randomness and processing power and whoever solved it first wins. So we're gonna do this game right now. And I got you hyped up for it. I was pretty excited. Yeah, just shout out the um, the results. I know. I'm getting a lot of yeah. 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 Yeah
So this is this is the assignment. So what are the first five characters of the SHA-256 hash of South uh, SX? S W all lowercase. So the first five characters of the SHA-256 hash of these four lowercase characters. And you can use um, your phones or your computers. Now what, what that is, is it's taking a chunk of information and it's converting it into uh, another form. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a miner actually has to solve um, trillions of these um, in like, actually to confirm them all. Do you want to show? Hmm? Yeah. So you take a chunk of information. In this case, it was a very short one. It was just four letters and you convert it into like another language. But the other language has to fit a very specific format. And that's what's, that's what's called a SHA-256 hash. So it converts it to that. Do you have a video on I have. So there's a way to actually do this by hand. It's taking some information and then putting it into a very specific format. And once you get it into this very specific format, you've solved the problem. So this is a video of someone doing by hand what Bitcoin miners and, and all of these giant server farms are doing constantly every minute. Uh, we're not going to show you the whole video because it's like eight minutes long. But this is the difficult uh, math equation that basically has to be done. And again, it's a little bit complicated, but we try to break it down to show that um, this is what computers are for. Can we use our abacus? <laughs> <laughs> you can, and that's, this person's doing it with paper and pencil. So it can be done, but it's going to take a long time. I think this person does it in like eight minutes. Um, you know, computers are, are crunching these constantly, these equations. I think that's not about exciting video. Yeah, maybe you have to dive a little bit more into this. So it used to be um, pretty easy for a like normal computer to mine Bitcoin to solve these equations with like trillions of seconds, really trillions every block. Um, but now you have all these very specialized hardware, uh, especially in, in big mining rigs in China. And it's, it's basically not, not possible anymore for like the average consumer to mine Bitcoin. They need more processing power and they use a lot of energy, so you've got to keep them cool. I actually met a guy who used to have a setup in his house, but he said his cats started getting very irritated because it was too hot. And so he tried to move it into the garage, but then he ran out of room. And anyway, so now individuals can't really do it anymore. That is at the same time one of the one of the big comments um, Bitcoin gets is that it's inefficient or energy inefficient. So these are like a very big footprint. And systems like Ethereum, for instance, they're uh, innovating on top of that as well. And they're trying to come up with uh, much more energy efficient ways of uh, securing the chain. Okay. Oh, there's a how, website how, that has a It's a there. website. I am. So, so I'll show you. So you basically take. Um, so I have. Um, There are many um, hash calculators out there. Let's see if this works. So here you, you enter whatever text, in this case S X S W, um, and then you say um, here it is. And then the first five characters, A7 F0. So you just find a spot online to do it. So uh, we are pretty much, that's pretty much the end of our presentation. We are going to answer any questions. We're going to be here for a bit longer if people have uh, want a little bit of assistance with setting up vaults or whatever. My phone is totally blowing up, so I'm super excited to be able to send you all some money from Bitcoin and uh, possibly some Ether. That's our contact information, and let's go to questions. Um, there is a uh, microphone. Yeah, actually, just anything with Bitcoin, yes. though, right? Yes. Um, online, I, like, I, I, I've never, I mean, I've heard of a few places that offer it, but I was wondering if you could speak to a bit more of how that actual, so now I have my wallet, if I want to buy something, what do I do? 
Right, so uh, you, there's stores here. I would actually look online and see who takes, who in Austin takes Sorry. Bitcoin. Because there are stores here that will actually accept, you can buy a coffee or whatever with Bitcoin. Um, but you can also go on overstock.com, Dell, um, Amazon not yet, but you can buy gift cards for Amazon. You can buy, actually you can buy gift cards, G-Y-F-T, gift cards for Target, for Whole Foods. So you buy the gift card with Bitcoin and then it's just like a regular gift card that we would use anywhere. Um, but there's a lot of online merchants and then there's actual local merchants. So here in Austin, like I said, there's three ATMs where you can go and buy Bitcoin. Uh, you can also buy Bitcoin from people with uh, a website called Local Bitcoin where they'll just exchange it. And then, and then just do a, a search and see who locally will let you um, buy coffee or whatever. Um, right now, most transactions are happening online with it because it saves on like visa fees and you know, any kind of transaction fees. There, there's also this, uh, this startup thing called Common Jar, um, and they have a, a browser plugin. And you can sort of basically whatever um, uh, uh, e-commerce site you want. And then you pay, actually pay, you pay the startup and then they purchase the, the product for you. And so you can pay them in cryptocurrency and then they, they pay the merchant in, um, in dollars or yeah. So that's a little bit Yes. Hi. Yeah. Super short, please. Do you have, guys have any opinions on two apps? One called Cycle that allows you to buy... Circle? Circle? Yes, yes. Actually, I like that wallet. Uh, I don't, all right, because I don't know, it sounds a bit weird to me putting my credit card there. And just yeah, so Circle is one of the best capitalized Bitcoin startups out there. And it's, it's pretty similar to Coinbase actually. So they offer this centralized solution, um, a very, very convenient one. So you can, just, you can basically buy Bitcoin using your credit card. You can withdraw Bitcoin at any given moment. Um, and they have all these apps and a whole suite of uh, tools to use. All right. So, and also, if you have an opinion on the new apps called Kisa, K E Z E, that basically allows you to invest in, in, in trades, etc., with Bitcoins. And if you can recommend any uh, app for buying Ethereum, thanks. Um, so the second one is Kisa. I don't know Kisa. Um, there are many startups out there right now. Keeping track of all of it. And then is there the third one, sending Ether or? Uh, any app that you could suggest in order to buy uh, from Bitcoins to Ethereum? Sure. So I, I can actually show you. So I just have the um, like the Ether, the, the, the main Ether wallets, which is made by the Ether Foundation, the Ethereum Foundation. So it's running here. And then you have this little button which says deposit Bitcoin. And if you push that button, then it opens a Shapeshift window. And Shapeshift is a, is a VC, yet another startup who basically converts whatever cryptocurrency to whichever other cryptocurrency. So you can put in, you can pay with Bitcoin or Blackcoin or whatever coin they have here. And then you can say, I want 100, 100 meters. And then they will give you a payment address of the internet works. Um, and then yeah, you can just send your Bitcoin and they send the ethers to your wallets over here, which has this uh, public address. That's a simple way. Uh, Kraken also has a, uh, is, is very ether friendly. Yes. Okay, so if you just like having to lose the access key or it gets stolen, um, do you, so what happens after that? Like, are you just SOL? Um, you lose it all, yeah. You are SOL. Do not use, lose your, your private keys. Most of these online wallets right now are password. They have passwords, but something like blockchain info, they don't store your password. So if you lose your password, you lose all your money. And that has happened quite a bit. Yeah, so, so some people I know, and including myself, are very paranoid. So they, they just want to like have a very secure way of storing their Bitcoin. And so I actually bought like a new laptop, which, which was never connected to, to the internet, uh, to create my private keys. And then I would um, yeah, make several copies, both on their paper wallets, which I would store in different uh, secret saves, etc. My, dad, my dad's place, my mom's place, whatever. Um, we also have, a, a, like, it's not a new, but it's like a two-year-old uh, innovation, which is called multi-sig. So you can have, uh, you can basically set the rules of who can manage uh, one specific Bitcoin address. So you divide it up in like five chunks, let's say, and, and then you can say, oh, okay, I need three, signatures, three out of five signatures, pretty much like the blue code, I think that works. 
Uh, so you need three out of five. You can, you can like, hand out five of these keys to your family mem members, and you only need three to unlock the bitcoins. Or you can have 100, or you can have three, or 5,000. Is it possible to have multiple wallets? Yes, you can have as many as you want. Yes. Yeah, in fact, I have a bunch. I have probably like eight altogether. And partly I do that to distribute the risk a little bit because there was quite a while in which a lot of these wallets were getting hacked. But partly to support new wallets, new companies coming up and creating them, and testing, uh, you know, research purposes and things like that. So yeah, I have a bunch of different ones. How do you recommend? Yes? Thank you for your time. I was curious, after you reach 21 million, what becomes the incentive to maintain the ledger? That's a very good question. So now the main incentive is um, the, the, 25, the 25 new bitcoins that come into, into the system every 10 minutes on average. Uh, but there's also a transaction fee component. So sending bitcoins from one place in the world to the other is not totally free. So there's a very, very tiny uh, fee um, yeah, linked to a, a bitcoin transaction. And so now the fee is relatively low, like very low actually, because the miners have enough incentive or almost enough incentive with only the, the block reward. But over time, the reward uh, will go down. So actually, I think next week or in a few weeks, the reward will half. So then the miners will only get 12 and a half Bitcoin per block they mine. Uh, it came from 50. So we had uh, a couple years ago, four years ago. And every four years, the reward halves until it's like zero. Um, and all the Bitcoins have been distributed at, 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 at that moment. And then the transaction fees will probably go up. It will, will still be very cheap, but they will go up. So then, so it's basically a curve like this for that. I also have a question about um, so for other op other applications of the blockchain, would that be an issue? Like that, how do you incentivize the maintenance of this network, basically, or the participation? Um, again, I didn't understand. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess if you if you apply the blockchain to other sort of other problem spaces, and if it's you know, trying to be as democratic as possible. How are the people talking about proposals to incentivize the maintenance of that network? The way that the miners release currency? Um, wait, so the way I, I interpret it, so if you go to the um, to the lottery example, for instance, if yeah. you want to run your own like decentralized lottery system, um, so if people want to interact with that little piece of software or that's the application that sits on the internet somewhere, um, then they need to you can also pay some kind of transaction fee. And so it's, so the, the more this, this uh, software gets executed, the more it costs, and the more incentive the miners have to mine this, uh, this, this uh, software. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you. I'm a total beginner. This is really helpful. Yay. Um, do you have any recommendations for further learning, not on the technical stuff, but on the philosophy and the technology and the future is thinking of it? Yeah, the, the websites that we posted up here, back up again, um, that's got a few, that's got a, a bunch on there um, that are great sources. A few of them are really basic. So, for example, uh, Coin Academy, uh, and we use coins. They have some really simple intro videos, uh, but um, any of the ones at the top are actually uh, news sites and, and magazines. Um, the magazine one, uh, where is it? Bitcoin Magazine, that's also a very good resource. And if you if, if you don't mind like actually reading Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, half of it still goes over my head, but every time you read a little bit more, you understand a little bit more, um, going to Bitcoin meetups, I think there's one actually tomorrow here in Austin, and hearing people talk about it. Um, and there are starting to be now online courses. Um, I actually just recently finished one uh, with Harvard. Harvard University offers an online course. A lot of them are set up for programmers, but I'm not a programmer, and you know I understood most of it, not all of it. So uh, there's tons of resources online, and I think these are good places to start. Hey, what's your suggestion? Oh, first of all, thanks for your time today. What are your suggestions to obtain true Bitcoin anonymity? Number one, and one of the ways that I'm aware of that you could use Bitcoin laundering services, you could send your coin to a site and you send it back right. longer. Can you really trust those sites? So, really, from a privacy perspective, right. what do you suggest? Can you really obtain true anonymity? Or is there like a 90%, 95%? I think you can and how do you do it? Okay. I think you can get pretty close. There's sites that, that aggravate transactions altogether. 
So it's, it, and then it goes out as one transaction that has a whole bunch mixed in before it actually is even uh, tracked on the blockchain. So there's certain, I, I don't know if blockchain is- That's right, you can, a forensic, can you do a, friend, a, forensic, a forensic analysis to with the blockchain to actually work that out? Or with corroboration so from- So I'm guessing yeah, actually you can answer that partner. question better than we could? Well, <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> so, so there's, there's one, um, there's actually only one very secure way, a uh, very private way, and that's um, uh, at the moment when new bitcoins are born. And so that's basically being a miner, you get the rewards, and you cannot trace where these coins came from, right? Yeah, I guess that would be one way. I was just trying to, I was just interested in what your perspective was of uh, the methods to do, that, to do it well. I don't tell people that it's anonymous. I say it's pseudonymous. Yeah, that's, I think yeah. there's ways to make it more difficult, but again, like I said earlier, I think if the NSA wants to figure out who did this transaction, they will. Okay. And then it all comes down to, um, it depends what you want to do. If you want to cash out Bitcoins, then for it, one way is use, using, not using these exchanges, but using local Bitcoins. So local Bitcoins is a site where you can say, okay, I want to sell or buy Bitcoins. And you just meet some person. Some yeah, person, right. Yeah. But there's a risk to that too. Right. There is yeah. risk to that, and that's, that's why they suggest you uh, meet, meet up in a in the McDonald's where everything is being filled. Yeah. The reason I asked is working on a book on privacy, so I was curious from your perspective wow. of you know, how you do it. So that's, that's I think cash is the most anonymous of currencies. Yeah, of course. If a, yeah, yeah. The person, yeah, there's the risk the person can ID you, right? So there's that risk. Or you could uh, obtain prepaid cards like vanilla Visa cards and train, uh, convert that to Bitcoin. They'll take 50%, of course. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, well, how did you go into that store with all the camera yeah. surveillance? Did yeah. you take Uber there? Did you take a runner? Right so you have to think about everything up to that. So. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. Just wanted to know Thanks. how you guys do. Okay. Hi. All right, thanks. Um, I'm just uh, new to Bitcoin, um, but I don't understand why the value of uh, the Bitcoin fluctuates so much from $10,000 or Bitcoin for a pizza to $1,000 a Bitcoin. Right. When it first started out, nobody knew what it was. They didn't know if it was, if it was going to work. And, and frankly, the biggest value of Bitcoin right now is the sheer number of people that are using it. So early on, there were just small numbers of people using it. It didn't have very much value. And now as more and more people have agreed that this is actually worth something, that they like using it and they're going to continue using it, the value has gone up. Now the fluctuations are affected, like most economic systems, by news, by government regulations, you know, by uh, research. Recently, one of the regional developers uh, lost his patience with the whole process and dropped out and got a full-time job somewhere, made a very public announcement, and the price went down. So there's all these factors that are affecting it right now. It has stabilized compared to how it did in the first three or four years, but it's, it's still a little bit of a leap of faith, right? It's a new six-year-old technology, and the more people use it, the more value it has. But it's still, you know, it's still got issues, and it's, it's new also in the sense that it's incredibly democratic compared to a government has issued it, it's determined what the value is, and they'll print more, you know, of this of these fiat currency when they want. So it's, it's a really um, experimental still, even though it's six years old, it's still a very experimental uh, technology. Okay, thanks. Hmm? Hi there. Can you help quantify how high the transaction fees will rise? You said it will rise but stay very cheap. Can you quantify that? Well, it depends. Um, I think Moore's Law goes into play there, and, um, and electricity costs. Um, it also depends on. Um, which blockchain project we're talking about. So we cannot really uh, predict um, where Bitcoin will be going because Bitcoin is pretty much tied to a very energy uh, consuming um, um, validating process. 